Italians love their food and their football. Prepared with passion, served with pride. But they don't like having their faces rubbed in it. Gigi, in the name of Channel 4, we're terribly, terribly, terribly sorry. It's my goal. Mm. That's not bad, actually. Could we try that with some ice cream, though? <laughs> OK. I'll be with you shortly, Ken. <laughs> Richardson, don't talk with your mouth full. Today it's fireworks all the way as we bring you the best action from last Saturday's crucial encounter in Naples as Italy and Russia battle for a place in next year's World Cup finals. There's highlights from this week's Italian Cup games as Serie A's finest bid for a place in the quarter-finals. James meets Italy's new national hero. And takes his usual look through the Italian papers. All that plus a look forward to tomorrow's live game on four, when the biggest club in Calcio, Juventus, play host to the newest member of Italy's elite, Parma. OK, well, more with Gigi coming up later on then. Don't worry, we used a stunt double for the opening, of course. But uh, where else could we start today's programme? But at the San Paolo Stadium in Naples, venue last Saturday for the weekend's biggest game, Italy against Russia. Just to go through this one last time, the two sides, of course, meeting with a place at next year's World Cup on the line. The first leg of this playoff having been held 16 days before in Moscow, with Italy achieving there a 1-1 draw. On Saturday night, anyway, came the decider, and interrupting their busy social lives to cover the event live were Peter Brackley and Luther Blissett. This is Albertini for Casiraghi, then Di Matteo. Soto made a surge down the right ahead of him. Albertini, a lot of the traffic being directed through him. Kokloff, breaking positively here for Russia. Still Kokloff, then Yuran. And he just took it a fraction too wide. And in the end, a routine save relief for Peruzzi, certainly for keeper of his class. But it was a chance, Luther. It was a good chance, and I think if the ball had been just a little bit firmer played to him here now, I think he could have possibly struck that first time. I mean, he just took it a bit far after getting his first touch, which enabled Peruzzi to close the angle on it. It was very difficult to beat him from there. Sotto. It goes Ravanelli. This could be a chance. Di Matteo. And Casaraghi. He's pointing for a goal kick. I think the referee, as he says, it's a corner. That's right. I mean, good defending there because uh, they've definitely have been in there, I think, Di Matteo. Very good defender. It took him right off his toe. Swabio and off Chinnikov, isn't he here, the goalkeeper? Yeah. It was a little bit casual there, wasn't he? Far too casual. It nearly went in. And Chinnikov, who plays for Benfica, but he's being kept out of their team at the moment by the veteran Belgian goalkeeper, Prudhomme. Oops, just got his hands to it then, the keeper. Dino Baggio was lining up for a shot. Took a swim, it was thin air. And the ball just wouldn't come down for him. He was looking a bit shaky, though. For Soto. Albertini. Yeah, no real support then for Soto. He didn't have the pace to get away from Popov. Italians seeking some inspiration to ignite them. Albertini with the free kick. Ferrara beaten away, 
good save by the keeper. Great reactions then from Ovchinikov. Ciro oh. Ferrara, who ventured forward. Never scored for Italy. He wasn't far away then. This is Costa Corta. Ravanelli. Now Ferrara. Baggio. Di Matteo. Baggio has continued his run still. Di Matteo. Trying to slip it on for Ravanelli. Okay, and the goalkeeper to the rescue. The Russians there were expecting an offside flag. But the flag stayed down. A little thing for the Russians. No question about that. A real opportunity for Ravanelli. Off by Di Matteo. This is Maldini. Oh, it was close. It was mighty close from the Italian captain. Didn't he do very well there? I mean, he shaped up to strike the first one, had the touch, and then struck a super shot there. And at first, I thought the goalkeeper might have touched it. It sailed wide. He hit it sweetly, yeah, Maldini. He, he did. He struck it very well. Cannavaro. Is that a super game at the back? My word, he's a resolute defender. Pop off. Albertini wrestling with Yanovsky. And the free kick given to Russia. We've got to show a bit more adventure now. If they are to deny the Italians their place in the finals. Ravanelli. Now Albertini. Options ahead of him. Casaraghi, and Nocco was there, but Casaraghi has steered it into the corner, and Italy have the lead. That's the goal, and that is the reason why he was up there, obviously, because uh, he's made a good run there, and he's been picked out, and he's put the ball in the back of the net. What a great finish by Casaraghi on 53 minutes, and what relief around the stadium. It was, it was a super finish, I mean, he was under a lot of pressure there. And to steer that into the corner the way he did was, uh, you know, it took great coolness to do that. Maldini just can't keep still. He's already been assured he'll be in charge if they make it through to France. I think if they don't, you could be under pressure, Luther. Yes, uh, <laughs> very important that they make it to France because... Uh, for the Italians not to qualify would be an absolute disaster. They're in trouble now, Kolivanov! That was all of their own doing. They were far too casual then, the Italians. Kolivanov breaking so quickly, and not far away from his first goal in this stadium. That's right, I mean, he's got that there and he struck it very well. It was always going wide, but uh, it all came around when Albertini gave the ball away. Ravanelli is going to come off to make way for Del Piero and also Nesta coming on. Alessandro Nesta, who's played, I think, in the last three now, certainly the last two against England and in the first leg in Moscow against the Russians. Maldini making the changes now. Albertini. This is Maldini. Releasing Del Piero. Buzz of anticipation around the ground. Del Piero, great little run. And he went for glory. He did indeed, and Casaraghi will not be pleased with that. He was stood six yards from goal all on his own. Still the Russians hoping something will come their way. Kolivanov. Bancho to clear. Kasuragi. Oh, this kick that might let in Kolivarov. Terrific covering, though, by Ferrara. Oh, a few hearts skip to beat then for the Italians. Ferrara with that desperate last ditch tackle. And that's it! A wonderful moment for the Italians to save her.
They are through to the World Cup finals in France next year. The straightforward route would, of course, have been preferable, but that's forgotten now. The display of being picked by England for the automatic qualifying place, but firmly behind them with success in this two-leg playoff. Well, the foundations were laid in Moscow with that thoroughly professional display in hazardous, treacherous indeed conditions and freezing Moscow. And tonight in front of this vociferous and hugely partisan Naples crowd of a hotbed of Italian football, they have completed the job thanks to this man, Pierluigi Casaraghi. 1-0 the score on the night, 2-1 then on aggregate. Tutto dovremmo sicuramente fare qualcosa di più perché eh, sicuramente dobbiamo fare di più perché oggi è andata bene però questa nazionale deve dare di più. Eh, Diceva è una partita troppo importante per poter coniugare bel gioco, spettacolo e risultato. Ciò che contava era andare in Francia e ci siamo andati e adesso ci godiamo questo risultato. Oggi è stato grande, io non ho mai visto... Il San Paolo è così pieno, è stato un colpo di scena impressionante. Sono stati veramente dodicesimi giocatori in campo e questi ci hanno aiutato tantissimo. Assolutamente, questa sera l'unica cosa che contava è il risultato. Non puoi pensare con l'attenzione di una partita come questa eh, di trovare il gioco, di fare una partita spettacolare in tranquillità. Non è assolutamente pensabile. Io, io dicevo prima dei colleghi... Eh, era probabilmente dalla finale mondiale che non avevo un gruppone in gola come, come stasera e molte volte la propria tensione non ti fa neanche dare il massimo. Well, there you have it. Action and reaction from Naples there. Commiserations thus to the poor Russians, but congratulations to the Azuri at last. And as we mentioned earlier, as a special Gazetta treat this morning, very shortly we'll be speaking to the hero of the San Paolo, San Gigi himself. That's in part two of today's programme, in which we'll also be finding out which sides are through to the quarterfinals of this year's Coppa Italia. Phew, all of that in a couple of minutes' time. ahead of him, Casaraghi, and Nocco was there, but Casaraghi has steered it into the corner, and Italy have the lead. Welcome back everybody, time now to enter the world of Gigi Casiraghi, a national hero and a man with a serious case of the ups and downs. Three weeks ago, as Italy played in Moscow, Gigi wasn't even on the bench. His club career at Lazio had hit a dead end and his fortunes with the national team were suffering the consequences. Things were so bad, in fact, that on the plane back from Moscow, Gigi had resolved to leave Lazio. Yet that crazy game that is Calcio had other ideas, as three weeks later, Gigi is once again one of Lazio's most cherished figures, author of a derby goal to treasure, and above all, he's back with the national side on Saturday night, saving the pride of the nation live on telly. Well, a few days after the big game in Naples, the Gazetta got Gigi's reaction. Tu stavi là 0-0. La paura che magari la Russia in qualche modo segni, o segna, condizionale, no? e um, 20 milioni di italiani che guardano, per non dire delle altre, non so quanti inglesi, eccetera, eccetera. <laughs> E ti capita questo momento, questa opportunità? È l'unico della partita, no? Sì, no, infatti è stata l'unica palla, insomma, gol che ho avuto. Insomma, solo nel primo tempo abbiamo avuto una palla con Ravanelli, mm. diciamo che non, non è stata una parte con tante occasioni da gol. E quindi sono stato fortunato, insomma, e anche bravo, fortunato allo stesso tempo nel, nel sfruttare l'unica occasione. Sì, non lo vedevi a gol, arrivare? Quindi. Lo, no, ma lo vedevi arrivare e sentivi che forse questo era il momento? Sì, no, beh, mh, anche se pensavo che uscisse il portiere, invece fortunatamente ha perso il tempo, non è uscito, quindi sono riuscito a calciare abbastanza tranquillamente. Mm. E poi dopo? E poi dopo la palla è entrata, per fortuna, e è stata un po' una liberazione per tutti, perché insomma, sarebbe stato un grosso peccato non non andare ai mondiali sarebbe stata una perdita enorme per il calcio italiano, però mm. tutto sommato credo anche per 
tutto il calcio in generale perché l'Italia insomma eh, credo abbia rappresentato sempre nel mondo del calcio una squadra importante quindi un eh, mondiale senza l'Italia sarebbe stato magari meno bello mm. se posso ti chiedo di questo ritorno da, da Mosca perché a quel punto l'hai detto pure no? eri talmente um, upset come si dice dispiaciuto per il fatto sì che ha chiesto alla Lazio di trovare un'altra sistemazione, no? E a questo punto sono cominciate delle storie in Inghilterra su Blackburn Rovers. No, il discorso è che, mh, vabbè, io ho parlato con il mio presidente, con Cragnotti, e avevamo eh, così visto anche l'opportunità di giocare fino a maggio in presto in qualche altra squadra. E un suggerimento tuo? Di entrambi, insomma, mm. diciamo che l'idea è partita da lui e niente, mh, poi le squadre non, eh, non lo so quali fossero. Poi due giorni dopo c'è stato il derby di Roma e Lì ho giocato, tutto. esatto, <ride> ho giocato, le cose sono cambiate, ovviamente poi la soluzione del prestito è andata a cadere e quindi eh, eccomi qua. Mm. <ride> Però sembra che o meno hai prenotato il... il Beh, il viaggio degli italiani in Francia è forse anche il tuo posto. Speriamo, Speriamo. <ride> visto che è cambiato in 15 giorni, sai, mancano ancora 5 mesi, quindi <ride> le cose possono <ride> cambiare tantissimo. Questo è vero. Gigi Casaraghi has always had a close relationship with the national side. Over the years, it's provided the backbone to his career through difficult times at club level. Indeed, despite the fact that he's often struggled for a first-team place, both in his time at Juventus and now at Lazio, Casaraghi has meanwhile managed to amass no less than 43 caps for his country. That's more than Italy greats like Roberto Bettega and even Gigi Riva. Still, now that he's back in the first team for the moment and now that he's confirmed Italy's place in the next World Cup, it's time to get his opinion on the question of the moment over here, which is, given their nervous and laboured performance against Russia, just how far do the Azzurri think they're going to get in France? È fuori di dubbio che bisogna migliorare, insomma, mm. questo è, è abbastanza evidente, soprattutto come gioco, però credo che ehm, credo che questo sarà possibile perché Innanzitutto adesso i giocatori abbiamo fatto delle partite importanti in una fase della stagione che è sempre stata molto difficile per i giocatori italiani. Eh, probabilmente stiamo molto meglio più in là, eh, quindi mi auguro quindi a giugno e luglio. E perciò bisognerà migliorare il, il gioco, bisognerà migliorare poi ovviamente i risultati, questa è la conseguenza. Però io sono fiducioso, insomma, credo che anche tutti gli italiani lo siano, nonostante insomma, ehm, abbiamo raggiunto insomma, la qualificazione allo spareggio. Mm. Anche perché, se mi ricordo bene, altri mondiali tipo 82, non è che l'Italia abbia brillato fino alle ultime... Le ultime sì, no, ha fatto, ha fatto fatica le prime due partite e poi è esplosa man mano. Mm. Ma questo magari fosse così. <ride> Però insomma c'è qualche analogia, però sai ancora presto per parlarne. Mm, e i favoriti? Ma favoriti sono sempre le stesse, tanto i mondiali se lo giocheranno sempre le stesse 4-5 squadre. Eh, Brasile, mm -hmm. Germania, Inghilterra, Francia, Italia. Vedremo. Vedremo. Okay. <laughs> Gigi Cateraghi there, as charming as ever. Now Gigi's side, funny enough, Lazio were back in action at the San Paolo in Naples on uh, Wednesday night against Napoli in the Coppa Italia. And it's time now for us, as it happens, to turn our thoughts to the Coppa Italia as Ken presents his roundup of the third round second leg matches, beginning with Inter Piacenza. Yet again, the problematic San Siro pitch was being re-turfed and Inter were forced to move the game to Monza. Not that a low-strength team seemed to mind much. Three up from the first leg, Inter were on cruise control, perhaps distracted by the upcoming Milan derby. A lackluster Ronaldo didn't seem too keen on the battle with his marker, Pietro Vercovod, and was taken off at half-time. It was left to Inter's second string players to muster some enthusiasm. Alvaro Rocoba's solo effort was as close as they came. 
For the first time this season, Inter failed to score. And in the final minute, Piacenza managed to seal a surprise victory as Giovanni Stroppa succeeded at the second attempt. Inter still went through on aggregate, although a rather meaningless result won't look good statistically, beaten by the only team in Serie A still without a league win. This match saw the return of Vujadin Boskov, the man who during the early 90s led Sampdoria to the greatest period in their history. After 19 minutes, Anissa Mihailovic gave Boskov a perfect start. After losing the first leg 3-2, Samp were level on aggregate. But Milan, facing the prospect of an away goals defeat, fought back. George Ware ran the home defence ragged as the Rossoneri were denied what seemed two very clear first-half penalties. But in the second period, their luck changed. Ibrahim Barr and Leonardo combined for a richly deserved equaliser. And when Leonardo was denied in the closing stages, man of the match Weyer was on hand to win the crucial penalty. Andre Cruz sealed victory for a fast-improving Milan. In difficult conditions, Pescara made it one all on aggregate after 23 minutes. Ivan Tishi, who scored in the shock win at Vicenza in the previous round, repeated the trick. And Fiorentina were in real trouble when just three minutes later, Pasquale Padolino was dismissed for retaliation. Michele Gelsi promptly put the Serie A B-side ahead on aggregate with a brilliant free kick. But on the stroke of half-time, Chiona's foul on Luis Oliveira gave Fiorentina hope. From the spot, Domenico Morfeo levelled the aggregate score. In the second half, the ten-man Viola defended a scoreline which would give them an away goals victory. And with three minutes to go, Rui Costa sealed their quarter-final place as Pescara's courageous cup run came to an end. After a 4-0 first leg defeat, only 6,000 home fans saw Igor Protti set Napoli on the way to a stirring fight back. The goal was especially sweet for Protti, who left Lazio for Naples during the summer. With 10 minutes to go, Giuseppe Giannini scored his first goal since returning to Italian football. Napoli were back in with a chance. And with three minutes remaining, the comeback of the round was suddenly a real possibility as Fabio Rossito made it 4-3 on aggregate. In a heart-stopping finale, Lazio had keeper Marco Balotta to thank as they avoided extra time, but only just. Bologna came even closer than Napoli. Two goals behind from the first leg, this brilliant effort from Igor Kolivanov levelled the tie on aggregate. However, extra time produced no further goals and Bologna were decisively beaten in the penalty shootout. Mohamed Callum's miss saw Atalanta progress to the quarter-finals. Bari, 2-1 down from the first leg, seemed to have a real chance in the return, particularly when Palmer fielded a virtual reserve side. However, the little southern side just couldn't find a way past Carlo Ancelotti's second 11. And when Filippo Maniero scored with what was virtually his first touch to the ball, Palmer put the outcome beyond any doubt. Like Palmer, Juve travelled south with a lead from the first leg. Like Palmer, they also fielded several reserves. And like Palmer, they won 1-0. Alessandro Birindelli scored a bizarre winner as Juve cruised through to the last eight with their eighth consecutive victory. All 
of which left one quarter-final place up for grabs as Roma and Udinese met at the Stadio Olimpico. And after a two-all draw in the first leg, there was everything to play for. Commentary from Gary Bloom. De Biagio. And Del Vecchio's through here. Batotto. Good clearance by the Udinese defender, but the danger isn't over yet. Del Vecchio. Paolo Sergio. He really is all hands to the pumps for Udinese. Ten here is Totti. Candela. Paolo Sergio. And Paolo Sergio scores midway through the first half. It's his first goal for the club since his move from Bayer Leverkusen. And Roma lead 3-2 now on aggregate. Not long uh, to half-time. Oh, there's an opening here for Bocci, and he's punished the mistake in defence for Roma and dragged Udinese back into this cup tie. It's an important away goal, but remember, Roma scored twice away from home in the first leg. Bierhoff was checked, and the ball fell invitingly for Poggi. Bierhoff. Totti. Del Vecchio! And Roma are in front again. Marco Del Vecchio scores his third goal of the season. It's 2-1 on the night now to Roma. Udinese have proved they won't be bypassed by Roma in this tie. Amoroso now, and Amoroso's through! Oh, he's just put it wide. Desperately unlucky. To Biagio, and Udinese have won it back again. Bierhoff's calling for the ball here, Amoroso's in there. Pochi's arriving, Pochi! Goodness me! Pochi can't believe his luck. The Roma defence desperately lucky here, and Roma's still on course for that quarter-final meeting with their neighbours Lazio. It just needed a touch from Poggi, and he almost got it. So it's a Rome derby in the quarter-finals. Not only that, but a Milan derby as well. And the latest stage in one of Italian football's most passionate rivalries, as Juventus meet Fiorentina. Of the big clubs chasing a semi-final place, it seems Parma, who face Atalanta, have by far the easiest task. We'll have highlights of all those games in the new year. And that's it for part two. After the break, we return to league action with a look forward to tomorrow's live game on four as Palmer prepare to visit Juventus. And before that, James will be taking a look at all the week's big stories, so don't go away. And tidings for the fat cats of football and whose kitties will soon be getting bigger. This follows a historic ruling this week by the Italian Senate who voted to legalise various forms of betting on sports. Gambling is go is how the Corriere della Sport greets the news on Wednesday. To explain anyway, in Italy at present there are only two ways that you can legally bet on sports. One is on the horse racing, the other by playing the Scadina, the Italian version of the pools. Naturally, Italians still bet in all the other ways too, they just do it illegally, creating a clandestine market worth quite possibly billions of pounds a year. The figures vary wildly, a bit like the Spice Girls, as of course there are no proper records. Again, a bit like the Spice Girls. However, the estimates are of a black market worth £1.5 billion pounds a year, wow. Well, under the new ruling, a uh, legalised system of sports betting will be set up by next April, they hope, in time for the next World Cup, run by Coney, the Italian Sports Council, who will in turn devolve the majority of the profits to the very sports being bet on. Sounds good, let's hear some numbers. Well, the Corriere della Sports panel of financial experts doubled the number they first thought of and came up with a prediction of £700 million as the first year's business, 35% of which, that's what, £245 million, will be going to the football clubs. Yes, but will it make them happy. Well, a major development there. And meanwhile, we turn now from high stakes to mistakes as we start off our transfer talk with a couple of very erroneous reports. 
First up, a story that you may have seen in England this week, with Napoli, who are off to the worst start in their 71-year history, thinking that they were about to sign Savo Milosevic, the Aston Villa forward. Indeed, Napoli, it's the day of. Milosevic was the Corriere's excited headline on Wednesday morning. A quote from the player here, I've always dreamt of playing in Serie A. He must have been held to share a bed with. And the two clubs reportedly agreeing a transfer fee of £5 million. Or well, Sadly, though, Milosevic himself nicks the whole deal the very same day, announcing, if I go to Italy, it'll only be for a big club. Phew, poor old Napoli. They were big enough for Maradona. Still, he never had a shot at Villa, of course. He had a shot from a Villa once, but anyway. Now, the other man issuing firm denials this week is, of course, Sampdoria's German international, Jürgen Klinsmann. Klinsmann's sudden departure to Genoa from the German national side last weekend somehow sparked rumours in England that he was about to dump slumping Samp for the even more tottering Tottenham. Nonsense, says Jürgen. I came back from Germany because of my ankle. OK, well, what about the Italian rumour right now that it has Sam sending him to Chelsea in return for the Sampdoria legend Gianluca Vialli? That's nonsense too, sighs Jürgen. I'm sick of having to go through this. In Germany, they talk about me going back to Bayern. In France, it's a move to Monaco. And in England, they write about a return to Tottenham Hotspur. It's just people using a well-known name to sell their papers. But I assure you, I'm staying in Genoa. Categorical stuff there, but... Uh, Good to hear. Meanwhile, though, two players who do look headed for the Premiership right now are Milan's departing Dutchman Edgar Davids and Winston Bohardy. The disappointing duo had looked bound for Barcelona, of course, but apparently they are no longer interested. Liverpool are, though, making this week a reported £4 million Bohardy bid. Foolhardy bid more like is the view here in Italy given Winston's form this season. Meanwhile for Davids there's talk of Arsenal and Manchester United. Now on the acquisitions front for Milan, meanwhile the Rossoneri are currently gearing up for what could be one of the biggest deals of the season. They've spent the last few weeks hot on the trail of Ukrainian wonder boy Andrei Shevchenko of Dynamo Kiev. Just 21 years old but the uh, mini Kiev striker already the terror of the champions. Kiev's president says there's no way he'll sell Shevchenko for anything short of £12 million. Pounds. Nevertheless Milan are optimistic. They made another trip out to the Ukraine last Saturday to see Andre in action against Croatia, a game in which... Anyway, for this morning's roundup, few. It's that time of the year again when rosy-cheeked toddlers pen notes to Father Christmas. The first faint sounds of sleigh bells echo across these snow-covered glens and France Football announced their 50 candidates for this year's European Footballer of the Year award. Every November, of course, uh, sports journalists from all over the continent are asked to vote from uh, France Football's list on the top player in a European league that year. The current Holder, of course, being Matthias Sammer of Borussia Dortmund. This time round, the nominations are too numerous, really, to list in full here. There being 50 of them, but one or two points of interest. There are 14 players from Serie A, which is still the highest total. Eight from the Premier League. There are four English nationals, Shearer, Fowler, Beckham and Wright. One Welshman, Ryan Giggs. And eight members of the Italian national side, despite their recent struggles. Both keepers, Pagliuca and Peruzzi. Ferrara. Del Piero. Zola, Chiesa, Inzaghi and Vieri. No mention in the list, surprisingly, for Paolo Maldini or indeed for any of Milan's players. The first time that's happened in ages. Meanwhile, making the magnificent 50, uh, eight foreign players from Serie A. That's Turam, Deschamps, Djorkaev, Zidane, Batistuta, Biehoff, Crespo, exclamation mark, plus, of course, the extraordinary Ronaldo. Runner-up last year, current World Player of the Year, and given his form this season, rock-solid favourite to add the European title to his collection this time around. Well, the decision will be announced on the 23rd of December, although the news generally leaks out sometime before that. That, anyway, is where we conclude our news roundup for now. Time for us, indeed, to turn our thoughts back to Serie A, which will be getting back underway Tomorrow afternoon, our live match will be Juventus against Parma, and very shortly we'll be hearing from Parma about what looks like being a tough encounter. Before that, though, with a quick reminder of how the last round of games left things in the division, here's Ken. Week 8 of the season produced no less than 30 goals and some memorable moments.
was there. Wanting some movement ahead of him. Still Fuzer. Now Nedved. Oh, that's excellent play by Lazio. Oh, what a good save yet again by Ferron. He's kept his team in this match. But not for long. That is a terrific finish from Nedved. Boxish. Could be in full flow here. That's a lovely skill by Boxish. What a goal. Oh, wonderful. What a goal that is, Peter. That is a wonderful goal. This is Terry Bo West making his way forward. Oh, and West again! Oh, he scored! He's won the game for Inter! And it's a goal! Oh, Tony Latella totally misjudged it. With nearly a quarter of the season gone, Inter and Juve are the only unbeaten teams in Serie A. Parma, Roma and Lazio will be hoping their first setback isn't far away. Elsewhere, Milan and Fiorentina move back into the top half, although both remain some way off the pace. At the wrong end of the table, little change. Every team in the bottom half lost the last time out. And for Piacenza, the only team without a league win, and Napoli, who've lost their last five Serie A games, things are already starting to look grim. Things are starting to look up for Gabriel Battistuta. After two blank weekends, the Fiorentina superstar's double strike against Lecce moved him two goals clear at the top of the scoring charts. The perfect way to celebrate his return to the Argentinian national team. More European action next week, so Italy's UEFA Cup representatives, in action on Tuesday, have their league games brought forward a day. This afternoon, Lazio visits Serie A's bottom club, Piacenza, while this evening, a far bigger occasion. With Juve not in action until tomorrow afternoon, Inter have the chance to go five points clear at the top. However, they have to beat their arch-rivals first. Despite their disastrous start, Milan's season has started to improve. 
Although they're still far from convincing, Capello's team have won their last two league games and in midweek booked another take with Inter in the last state of the Italian Cup. So this is the perfect time for the Rossoneri to really kickstart their season. Although against Ronaldo and company, that's not going to be easy. It's one of European football's greatest occasions and you can see highlights of the game in next week's Gazetta. And tomorrow afternoon you can see live coverage of the weekend's other big match. A game which in recent years has become one of the highlights of the Serie A calendar, as James now explains. Yep, that's right. Tomorrow afternoon here on Channel 4, Juventus, the grand old Aristos of the Italian game, have a lunchtime appointment with Serie A's nouveau riche upstart Parma in one of Calcio's newest rivalries, but one that's already pretty keenly felt. Remember three seasons ago, a reanimated Juve were roaring to their first title of the decade and two cup final appearances. Only one team could keep pace with Vialienko, and it wasn't Milan or Inter, Lazio or Roma, but Parma. Fueled indeed by the dairy product millions of their club sponsors Parma Lat, Nevio Scala's team seemed back then on the verge of becoming true champions. However, finishing a close second to Juve in both Serie A and the Coppa Italia, and beating them in the UEFA Cup final was to prove rather the high point of the Scala era and a year later things were looking very different. While Juve indeed then were on their way to winning the European Champions League, Parma had slumped to their worst ever season under Scala. No trophies and a sixth place finish in the league meant the end for a man who had masterminded one of Italian football's most spectacular success stories. The club had decided it was time for something completely different. Scala's replacement, bright young thing Carlo Ancelotti, had just one task, succeed where his predecessor had failed and win Los Scudetto, and win it quickly. At first it seemed Ancelotti wouldn't last long enough to win anything. His all-new tactics were hugely unpopular with many of the old guard and a disastrous start saw Palmer emerge as anything but title contenders. Indeed, by last December, Ancelotti's new-look team were surprise relegation candidates. This has been a squad that has suffered a lot. And that we all wanted to get out of that situation. I think there are players that di grande classe, avevamo, avevamo una, una rosa sumamente importante e credo che non meritavamo la posizione che eravamo. Eh, credo che il fatto eh, di avere un allenatore, un mister che non ha dato tanta fiducia a questa squadra è più facile giocare. Eh, non è stata una cosa facile, abbiamo avuto tante difficoltà. Adesso, nel momento in cui i giocatori hanno capito bene che cosa dovevano fare, che cosa io chiedevo da lo, a loro, le cose sono nettamente migliorate. Adesso c'è molta convinzione in quello che si sta facendo, sia in allenamento che in partite, e le cose vanno bene. They certainly are. When things seemed at their lowest ebb last season, Ancelotti's ideas finally clicked and Parma stormed back. A spectacular second half to the championship, winning no less than 15 of their last 21 games, saw Palmer surge back to the top as once again they finished second to Juve in the league. This time they're aiming to go one better. Belief in Ancelotti and his methods is total, and whilst it may not be pretty, it works. So far, indeed, only league leaders Inter and European champions Borussia Dortmund have got the better of what has become one of Calcio's toughest teams. Tomorrow, we should find out exactly how far they've come. Parma have basically the same team as last year, whilst Juve, after their annual purge of an all-conquering squad, don't look quite as impressive. Indeed, Parma seem to feel Italian football's greatest club could finally be there for the taking. The year ago, beyond the fact that talking about the past, I don't know anything, but I think that between two confronts, we've won one and we've won the other. Questa volta, se possibile, dobbiamo vincere tutti e due. Eh, io credo che la Juventus, come ho detto, la che era l'anno scorso, rimane sempre una buona e grande squadra, ma qualche cosa ha perso. No, adesso la Juve non sta giocando benissimo, ma il problema è che ha molti infortunati. E 
e giocatori nuovi che sono arrivati, altri che sono andati via, quindi qualcosa è cambiato, ma credo che a breve tempo la Juve sarà, ritornerà la squadra, ad essere la squadra più forte. Noi abbiamo questa forza, questa voglia di arrivare sempre in alto che a volte ci permette di competere con le più grandi de, del mondo e per adesso stiamo facendo bene e vogliamo continuare a farlo. Palmer in confident mood then, but can they really get the better of the mighty Juve? Well, to find out, tune in to Channel 4 tomorrow lunchtime at around 1.15pm as Football Italia wheels its way onto your screens like some kind of visual sweets trolley, except this one carries no trifles, of course, just the creme de la creme. Juve Palmer, anyway, our live match, a potentially decisive encounter for this season's championship race. Make sure you join us for that. For now, though, from all of us here, it's a Riva Dirty.